Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, my name is Yoshi. I would like to start the program. Maybe about uh, half an hour is left uh, for this session, but uh, uh, we would like to be flexible and we would like to be aggressive and also positive about uh, the discussion. I think that uh, you have uh, started uh, to have a very good uh, feeling. It seems to be fun, amusing, and also exciting. I'm sure that uh, you feel that uh, it is a playful omoroi, playful, amusing, fun, uh, is our motto in Kyoto University. Instructors, teachers, faculty seem to be enjoying the time. In that case, uh, that is an enjoyable. So that is very important that uh, the feeling is conveyed to students. And those uh, faculty members are now actually participating in the MOOC. It is not about coincidence. It is an, a quite an important an element of Kyoto University. And so uh, we have invited an, uh, four people. And now uh, Dr. Yamada is a unique person, although he's not here. He said that uh, he, some students said that uh, I will do it for you. And uh, Dr. Yamada says, oh, you don't have to do that. I will do that. Uh, he is a uh, man of uh, virtue. And so, and, uh, so and, uh, Actually, yeah, Dr. Yamada is uh, actually taking the lead, and uh, we actually provide uh, support because uh, the other uh, people actually depend on us. But the, uh, Dr. Yamada is uh, quite an uh, actually a strong and uh, also positive and a future forward looking person. And he is one type of ideal, especially for our mission. And already we have gotten uh, such a uh, person and uh, such a uh, personality, which is very promising and reassuring for us in our commitment. And now, uh, the uh, talk to, uh, Kyoto UX and the features were actually discussed uh, in the first presentation. And that was uh, uh, by, uh, the, by uh, Dr. Sakai. And also, uh, that, uh, Dr. Ito's uh, presentation was uh, quite interesting. The trade itself was fascinating. And uh, it was in four weeks, and uh, students, and, and also that uh, the learners, and, uh, move up and, uh, rapidly from the base to the summit. It is uh, a jump, and a big jump. And uh, in a MOOC, and, uh, that is an uh, important issue. He is particularly committed to MOOC, and uh, particularly for uh, that uh, type of nature. And uh, uh, what uh, is advantage? And, uh, that is very important. Whenever we think about MOOC, and uh, especially in the initiation time, uh, we just uh, show it and uh, so that it need to be actually I mean, uh, fascinating, and then the number get to get together, so it is uh, a victory. But it was now uh, rather simplif simplified version of gaming, but uh, we have passed that age, and we would like to move on uh, to the educational landscape. And, uh, and uh, Dr. Yamauchi is uh, making a large contribution. He is thinking about the program itself, and also uh, the benefit uh, given to the teachers. And it is uh, a newly launched uh, program. And so from the very beginning, MOOC is an actually part of the essential elements. So he is taking it very strategically. And uh, Dr. Taguchi uh, gave us the data from various uh, perspectives and uh, the analysis is conducted. Analytics are uh, often mentioned, but uh, it is, uh, should be steady and uh, ground to us type of an approach so that it would be benefiting the students. And actually the, the data show that. I am not an only speaker, and so I would request uh, Dr. Pugh to break the ice and uh, to give us uh, some insights. And you have listened to Dr. Yamagiwa's presentation, and uh, you have given the keynote address, and you have listened to the presentations. What is your comment? What is your feeling? And if there is any feedback uh, to those uh, Japanese presentations, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I, I now have this turned to the right channel, which is helpful, but I don't need to listen to myself. Um, so uh, despite my jet lag, I arrived last night. Um, your level of interest and your, the fun that you're having is, is, and your enthusiasm um, helps us and helps, helps my colleague, Zach. And um, we'll be sure to take our learnings from, from the information that you shared us with us today, both back to our office, but also share it across a consortium. So thank you very much. And I, I admit <laughs> my energy is going down, so I apologize. Um, 
I, uh, I am leaving, uh, as I often do when I come to a campus, I am leaving with some homework. And my homework is both myself and my team, Zach, sorry about this, are going to have to take the culture of service MOOC. Um, I have been, I personally have been in the services business uh, and technology firms for the past 15 or 20 years. And uh, I'm fascinated I'm fascinated by what I've heard so far with the sneak preview of your course. So I hope that um, I certainly will take it and I, and I am going to try to stick with this MOOC. I am one of the per, per, perennial uh, uh, lookers. Your research is, is spot on with how I go in and out of a course. Um, and I, I think that uh, a few people approached me as I went outside earlier to grab a breath of fresh air. Uh, uh, per personally, I would say that the thing that um, I find most exciting about what's coming up next, both from the learner perspective, but also from the school's perspective, is how this idea of credentials and credit is going to play out. And I did hear um, both from some people speaking, as well as some people that caught me on the way out, just a, a certain level of interest in, in figuring that out along with us. And um, I think it's going to be the thing that really disrupts uh, higher ed. I think it's going to be the thing that really allows us to achieve sustainability. And I think we have barely um, begun to scratch the surface on what that's going to look like. But we couldn't ask for a better set of partners to move ahead with us on this. So um, I'm going to turn it over to whatever you, however you want to run the panel. It looks like you have a bunch of questions. And I'm going to try to stay tuned. Uh, unless you want to. Uh, read the questions. Yeah. No. It'll be a very short meeting for a short panel. Thank you very much. So, we have no time for that, so we have no time for that. We have no time for that. We have no time for that. Time is getting on. There are many questions coming from, from the audience. I'm sorry that uh, I cannot address all of them. But uh, and, uh, the questions are to all the panel. I would like to actually give the answers to all the panel members. So now, Dr. Asakai. I would like to repeat uh, your name and also the affiliation. Dr. Sakai gave the first presentation about the, the, uh, the current status uh, of uh, the Kyoto Yuks. So this is uh, the CEMS and uh, communication. Terada sans and a question. I know that person. So I have identified the person's name. So why is uh, there only limited number of MOOC facility uh, in Japan and now a few years back? And is it because of the language barrier? In the United States, there are many MOOC institutions and also facilities. Is only the United States are outstanding in the performance or maybe number? And if so, in Japan, how are you going to enlarge the coverage and number? And as a Kyoto University and also Japan, the education institution, do you think that it is not necessary to enlarge it, or do you need some staff and human resources to enlarge and expand it and advance it? Thank you very much for that question. Thank you very much. Uh, so the number of universities who are providing MOOC or more courses will be provided in, generally in Japanese university. Uh, in general, well, I have to say I don't know. So at the Kyoto University, uh, quantitatively and qualitatively, we'd like to enhance our effort with uh, MOOC. And so the uh, learners outside the universities, we are delivering our lecture. That's what we started. But now, from now, we will be providing the online education to the uh, learners in the campus of uh, Kyoto University students and also the uh, students outside the uh, university as well. I th my personal uh, idea is that uh, we have to go for that election. Why U.S. is outstandingly uh, enormous in number of learners? Well, there are uh, MOOC brands uh, popping out, uh, not just in English-speaking countries, but also some countries in Europe. Uh, you mentioned about the uh, Russia, the MOOC is starting. So MOOC courses are increasing. So not just the U.S., but of course, 
uh, well, in other countries as well, and we are disseminating JMOOC. That's already the fact. So it's not that the MOOC is only concentrated in US. So increasing trend of a MOOC in Japan, well, I don't know. JMOOC is increasing, is that right? But disseminating in English language is a bit uh, difficult. For example, uh, some of our staff are not good at English uh, because of that the communication level. There is an issue, yes, but uh, we'd like to overcome that with some new ideas to improve. Let's try, and we will know. Thank you very much. OK, so Professor Ito, please. There are uh, questions from several audience. The, uh, so the inlet is a junior high and a high school level, but the outlet is a graduate school level. Well, what is the intention behind this? Why this level of education are different in the uh, incoming and the, uh, you know, outcome? And also, Professor Hasegawa, I, I said that, that the, uh, uh, said that we'd like to give this education to our high school students. But in the middle, the support of the staff is required. But uh, is that fine with it? So two points. So what is the intention behind the setting of educational level of uh, incoming uh, student level and the uh, outcome? Well, there is no intention, just a plain fact. In retrospective, that was what it was. So initially, when we started out uh, MOOC, who is the target audience and what is the expected level of uh, academic background of the target uh, audience? I asked uh, that question to the, the MOOC secretariat, but uh, I was told, OK, that's up to you. You decide. But normally, uh, in the university, the, when the freshman is advancing to the uh, second grade, uh, there are several requirements of mandatory uh, subject. But that was the basis to create a curriculum for the second year. But the, for my MOOC course, there is no such background basis or baseline. So we started from a scratch. But the, uh, in retrospective, the fact was, as I told you. So not just uh, delivering the uh, mathematics as a technique, but I'd like to incorporate the, the latest trend of math. And what's the lecture to be like that? So in a way, a kind of entry level was set the law to allow them to come into. And a later question is, uh, is the support of the uh, faculty necessarily in the middle? Well, my uh, intention was not that way. Uh, I did not uh, design the course to require the faculty help. Well, uh, although the content is the same, the level of understanding could be varied uh, on the uh, audience. Maybe junior high student, too, too difficult. But even the high school students, uh, some of them is able to understand the content and understand the trend of uh, mass. OK, now the society is dealing with uh, such an issue. But uh, I think if that is more deepened in its content, uh, uh, graduate school level may be required. That, that graduate level may be a bit too too much. It's not that I designed a course to require graduate level knowledge, but so in a kind of a, the world of mathematics, which is not to be able to be seen unless you go to the graduate school, can be provided online. That's the intention. So do you remember number of Kyoto UX, Professor Sakai? So the number and the 004 is not prime number, is it? So that question is why and 004 is not prime number. It is your number of an um, And so Dr. Kajita from an, uh, another academic institution says, I should not blame him. And so Dr. Yamagiya got an, a zero. Otherwise, and maybe you would have gotten a prime number, not a 004. It was a mistake, and I have to apologize for that. And so uh, the 
the uh, next uh, president uh, might come. So what should we do? And so maybe actually that uh, permanently zero would not be used uh, by anybody else. And so uh, that is another question. Maybe one could be possible. But anyway, just internal talk and our internal circumstances. Now, uh, Dr. Yamauchi, and uh, this is an actually addressed to all the panel. This is uh, from uh, the professor uh, in the Waseda University. Uh, Kyoto UX and, uh, is considering how to advance and also evolution. And uh, how are you going to evolve? And uh, today's uh, presentation was focused on, on the Graduate School of Management. And Dr. Yamauchi himself and uh, yourself is an evolving. And uh, Dr. Yamauchi said that we should never use the word evolve in such a situation context, social context. It is biological term. Uh, but uh, you are launching this new class and, uh, as a new course. And uh, as a uh, teaching and a uh, professor, how are you going to evolve yourself? And how are we going to actually capitalize on the new opportunity of MOOC so that then you can advance on your own career. And so what sort of idea do you have about evolution? I mean, based on the service perspective, and could you please elaborate on the evolution yourself and also the course? Rather complicated question. When I am uh, involved in the MOOC, Something is in my mind. When the research needs and are complete, and I can transfer it to a class. I was preparing teaching, teaching materials, and also research and materials were reviewed. And then I realized that there were so many things which I had not realized or understood. And so the MOOC creation is an actually beneficial for me to advance my research, especially how to describe what is in my mind, what I have researched and in the English language. Language. And uh, because of the Japanese culture and its uh, features, sometimes the translation is not so straightforward. And so I believe that the uh, MOOC kind of involvement is a really um, beneficial for me. MOOC kind of participation per se is beneficial. And uh, there is uh, quite a lot of tasks in front of me, including designing. But uh, I am supported by many people. And uh, I am uh, and disseminating it uh, to various cultures in the world. And in each culture, hospitality is uh, considered in what way? And uh, I can give that subject matter to those uh, audiences. And so they can say that in my country, in my culture, and uh, this is what I think. So if uh, I can actually uh, coll collect uh, that information and their perspective, that would be amusing. And also, it's not only just uh, my uh, giving the assignment to students, but then uh, I can benefit from the feedbacks and also answers from my students. As I talked about tonight, uh, service uh, is uh, very important, and programming is also important. The MBA introductory course is now to be prepared and offered. So it is the introduction before moving on to MBA course. So in the future, I assume that uh, there would be an online facility so that uh, more and more people can participate in that. I believe that that is uh, one of the intentions in uh, the administration. And so as a first step, uh, we actually provide a service, and uh, they have to pay for the tuition. And then uh, we actually give uh, the lectures. But uh, anyway, that is uh, one step forward and uh, one uh, step uh, to start. And on the part of the businesses, and what sort of impact can we expect? And so or the time limitation, if and we invite and the professionals to come, and for example, the videos and can be used so that and all the lectures can be actually video clipped and so they can utilize their own pastime, especially when they are very busy as businessmen. And so I have got my personal ideas. It's not my team only, but I am thinking various ways. Thank you. Dr. Yamauchi says that the MOOC involvement was really, really beneficial for himself. In Kyoto University, that is especially important, faculty development, FD. Faculty development is important. It is an education. And so some if professor says, I would like to commit to my own research rather than to education, but we have to make a full commitment to education and quality enhancement. If you look at an education only, however, you cannot do that. Dr. Yamagiwa actually emphasizes the importance, so niche and Kyoto University derived the 
a primatology is now disseminating online facility was disrupted by Dr. Yamagiwa, but then he is now on board, and it's not in my talk. And Dr. Yamagiwa has gotten high aspirations, and Mokkane is a very good tool for realizing his aspirations. So, so various and people have gotten various ideas, and the commitment is made by different entities, which I deeply appreciate. Okay, so we'd like to return to that point later. Uh, Professor Taguchi, there is a question. The first question is uh, from Professor Kajita. Well, in order to deepen the individual learning, what data is necessary? What data is most important? This may take several days for you to answer this question, I guess, but one more uh, from whom there is no name mentioned. Well, the history of learning MOOC is whose who's information? Is it uh, public information? If that is a public, dot, 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 dot. So, the, I mean, maybe ownership is questioned. So the ownership is asked, who is the ownership? of the so i would like to ask uh, professor Pugh as well the data ownership of a data who have ownership of a data okay first uh, what data is should be taken should be obtained well there is no specific requirement uh, for the data as a uh, mooc Lots of research has been done for the necessary data of a MOOC. On the basis of that, uh, so using the data, what should be elucidated? Uh, that was a starting point of this research. Well, uh, when the data is visualized, uh, we are able to verify the, the data because data is, we can see, for example, whether the uh, learners are committed to the content of the study, which may be related to the level of understanding and deepening uh, level of the understanding, or uh, maybe we can guess uh, the certain level of the knowledge is required, or some kinds of a psychological background of the students, some of the kind of withdrawn in the positive posture of the student may uh, be different in their outcome. Well, out of the big data, what should be taken as a meaningful variable? We started out our research, tried to look for the meaningful variables. Uh, we make a kind of an interview, uh, try to be more visual, kind of, a, you know, solidify what we saw as a variable. So we, we are researching on what variables should we take out of the massive uh, big data. So who is the owner? Of, who's the owner of the data? When we perform the interview with students, yeah, we get the permission. We ask them to what extent this content can be disclosed. We ask them. Um, but for the history, uh, well, maybe in the first document of a signature, this kinds of uh, uh, clause of uh, disclosing information were will be written in a document. What about the book, the Poo, uh, Professor Poo? What do you think is the uh, uh, ownership of the data acquired in that process? Who's the owner of a data? For the translation. So um, uh, there's a couple of points I'd like to make. So um, in our terms of service, uh, the students that take the edX courses are aware that their data may be used for research. So that, as a starting point, when someone registers on the platform, they are aware that their data may be used for educational research. Um, in terms of how the data is then, I'm not going to talk about ownership. I'm actually going to talk about distribution. So the way that the data is distributed is that, so for Kyoto's courses, or I see my friend from Waseda out there, Waseda's courses, the university gets their own students' data in something called a data package. <clears throat> and that's for a certain type of um, partner of edX. So anyone that's a contributing, tr uh, pardon me, a charter member or a contributing charter member. That data contains all the data that the student put in about themselves. 
So if you design a course where you're asking for a lot of information about the student, then in your data package you will be getting that information. Um, as, as part of the consortium, and again as being a charter member of the consortium, uh, which several of the schools in Japan are, you also are entitled to, if you participate in the research data exchange, you're entitled to the de-identified data from the other schools. So you get your own student's data that has, that's all the data, and then you get de-identified data if you're participating in RDX, research data exchange. So I, I hope that covers off the question sufficiently. I, the legal, the word ownership for me has legal implications, and I'm not an attorney. I'm not a lawyer, so I don't exactly know. Um, I did want to mention two other things in terms of, maybe three things, in terms of what data. I'm not a researcher by any means, but we do have an analytics tool that's part of edX, and our team, we have an analytics tool always looking at what, what is the data, how do you turn data into information, and how do you visualize the data on the platform. So I saw some screenshots today that probably came out of, of edX, and we are, um, we are constantly updating our analytics tool both from the instructor uh, standpoint, but also from the student standpoint, if, if you will. Um, lastly, is it last? Oh, two last things. Um, I, I actually think defining what is the data is a great opportunity to collaborate. Um, Harvard and MIT have been at this the longest. They have the largest body of courses. They have the largest body of students. They're between MIT and Harvard. Um, I think that they have the largest number of, on average of enrollments. Maybe UC Berkeley is, is, is quick behind them. So um, if, you, if you're struggling with what data to use, I encourage anyone in this room to reach out to their edX program manager, express to them the challenges that you're facing, and then we'll see if we can find an opportunity for you to collaborate with colleagues that have some expertise in this area that's been doing it for a little bit longer. Um, Last but not least, I haven't heard it mentioned, and since we're talking about data, I thought I would mention it. There is a very powerful tool around for, for the collection of data, and you might already all be aware, but the platform um, enables A-B testing. So you can design a course and have two, and have a, have, um, and test different ways of teaching in your course and see the results coming through in the data. So, um, it's not really on the what, well, I guess it's related to what data. So um, I, I only mention it because I hadn't heard it talked about here yet today. Um, and it's a very powerful tool from what I am told from, by the researchers and the instructors, actually. Thank you very much. So, so what about the scope of data? So the scope in which and we can handle the data is limited, especially personal data is included. In that case, and we have got a very, very stringent rule for the management. Unless approved by the administration, you, nobody can access it, nobody can handle it. We are very, very careful about the data handling. What about the assessment data, the performance data? So instructors and also the lecturers and do provide them. Otherwise, you cannot have any data about the student's performance. So uh, the, the analytical data should be meaningful to those uh, professors who have given that uh, raw data. It's not uh, totally free handling. We always uh, discuss and explain the purpose of that data management, and we get approval from the ownership and the initial owner, and then we integrate the data. And thank you very much. I'm afraid that the time is getting on. And so there is one nasty question, if you don't mind. So when uh, you are involved in MOOC, and, uh, what is the prioritization? It is actually the uh, trade secret, so we cannot disclose it. It is Kyoto University's trade secret. So there is something. So there are contents on the MLS, and uh, there are online materials, and also OCW and MOOC, and uh, there are many other resources. So those are the teaching materials, electronic ones, and can be catalyzed on. But in what way? At various levels and at various courses, and depending on the teaching staff and the total university, and also the cross and functional projects in which the Kyoto University is involved. In those different arenas, 
and we can use them. But the prioritization is and decided. It's not a decision making an entity, but you know, we have got the deliberation and also the body in which discussion is done. So it's not about how to use MOOC. So we discuss you know, what sort of education we aspire for. So in that case, you know, OCW is used in hot way. So it is you know, a company, uh, the, uh, the university wide right, you know, total comprehensive discussion arena. So unlike Harvard, we have got you know, different. Uh, so in Harvard, you know, so, uh, there are long queues of professors who would like to have you know, a MOOC and a facility. In Kyoto University, things are not so matured. And maybe things are getting warmer, uh, but not so mature. So not so many uh, teachers and actually apply for the MOOC and the facilitation. But uh, I'm sure that is an important. It is not uh, the number of students you can collect. If uh, we actually invite uh, some television celebrities, and uh, we can have a large number of the students in the class. It's not good. It's not really what we want. And so uh, the department commitment and the Kyoto University's aspirations and the teachers and the missions and the visions are to be always and the basis and for the prioritization. I believe that an increasing number of teachers and will participate in our initiative by sharing the common missions. So before concluding this session, I would like to invite each panel to talk about the future vision of 10 years' time. Maybe MOOC as a term might have disappeared already in 10 years' time. But please imagine 10 years' time. You have started to be engaged in MOOC. So when you think about the future as an extension, is there some uh, potential? You don't have to think about your responsibility. You can be irresponsible. Please talk about yourself. And please talk about higher education across the world. You can, uh, you can talk big. You can actually speak big. I don't mind. So anybody can start it. And, uh, Dr. Sakai, you say, you, your face said that, uh, am I the first again? Am I the first but again? But not ready, but. Well, uh, we speak about English language. Language issue should be solved already in 10 years, and there is the kind of in automatic uh, translation available anyway. So that issue should have been solved uh, in 10 years to come. So in the near future, well, uh, what we want to be is, uh, you know, uh, uh, teaching. There should be some kinds of the uh, real-time notification of what uh, I teach. For example, anyone can see upon the smart f smartphone. That's the ideal in 10 years. What about uh, Professor Ito? Well, 10 years to come, uh, it's beyond my imagination, but uh, the mathematics, uh, my specialty, my uh, personal uh, uh, impression is that uh, compared to 10 years ago, what is different? Now, well, the internet and the uh, computers spread in its use. When I was a student, when I was studying in graduate school, uh, uh, some percentage of the uh, spend, uh, time was spent in library and the copying the documents there. The copiers, copiers uh, is now faster, but uh, the related uh, literature, there are 20 papers. Uh, I took one hour, two hours spent in library looking for literature and copy them. But now we are able to manage just one minute or two minutes, see the necessary data, using them for our research and study. That's what I'm comparing 10 years ago. So now, 10 years from now, what will happen? For example, the research and education activity, other than the uh, periphery of that, the time should be should be reduced. I don't know exactly what part will be reduced, but uh, for example, the research fund I am engaged in is that uh, uh, there are some part that uh, I require the discussion with people. Because of that, I have to go abroad. There are certain knowledge that I can acquire overseas or in my business trip, but uh, that distance can be shortened. For example, online chat, online conference. But uh, still, there is some difference in what is obtained uh, in such kind of a teleconference with a real meeting. Uh, yes, 
uh, issue the professors are talking about is the uh, inclusion of an interactive dialogue. Well, I think that the part will evolve and the social learning part will develop. Thank you for a precious comment. Professor Yamauchi, please. Well, again, this is beyond uh, my easy imagination, but in uh, classes of uh, graduate school, uh, in a base, basic type of uh, lecture, there is a textbook. That is important that we repeat the teaching basics because we have a textbook. But at the same time, there are some part of the uh, classes of which are very much related to my own specialty research, which will be revised and renewed uh, every year uh, as time goes by. But the basic part as a content should be broadened more. In the university, we are in a very small part of the university, the Department of Management, uh, more than uh, the less than 10 faculty members, and it's a very new one. We can't provide everything in such a small department, uh, but uh, uh, there should be more diverse content on as regards the basics of the management, and every student is able to receive that basic part. And we will be more devoted to the latest uh, research, which can be turned into the the course content. This will be 10 years to come. That is my hope. Uh, that's wonderful. The flipped classes are talking about, talked about now. And uh, Professor Pugh, uh, the Arizona State Universities and uh, uh, your example say that the curriculum itself is flipped over. So the, the first freshman's course will be online. So freshman, anyone can learn the uh, and acquire the credit of the freshman's course in the State University of Arizona by online. So anywhere they are living, they can get. And that is a very massive change and conversion. Uh, in order to deepen what we want to study, our researchers and students can spend their time, whatever they wish to spend. Uh, maybe the FRIP course can be utilized for that purpose. Uh, I really hope that the your the management graduate school of management will try and experiment uh, new ways to do so. So. So uh, personally, exciting ideas are always generated by you. Dr. Taguchi, do you have any comment? I would appreciate your feedback. I don't think I can. But uh, there are so many contents which we can learn. So maybe we have to learn more and more. On one hand, I said that uh, and so we have to learn. So my children's generation will have to continue to Learn and learn because things are actually, I mean, more than full. Everything is more than saturated, and so we need to identify the trend of learning among the younger generations. And so maybe in ten years' time, so things and would be actually continued. But then even if not encouraged, and students do not learn, and so maybe some children like to talk and about their friends and might be on the screen and then while talking, the children can learn and can become wiser. So humans and wisdom can advance and through this and sort of facilitation. Yes, automation and also the overcoming the shortcomings of and humans and learning capability. So I would hope that in such a situation, such a thing would be actualized. Now, Dr. Pugh, uh, could you please talk about an uh, edX and a uh, 10 years times and a uh, future uh, status and a uh, potential? Or oh, maybe you can speak a bit as well. Uh, I'm kind of lucky I get asked this question all the time, and I came up with my answer last summer, um, sitting in a room full of attorneys, actually. Um, they, w they wanted to talk about MOOC and IP, intellectual, intellectual property. Um, so I'm going to ask. I'm going to answer the question in a very edX kind of way. So our top, uh, our mission statement is three pronged, and it's in order of priority. And the first one is um, access to high quality education for everyone. So uh, in 10 years' time, uh, the big audacious goal that I personally have, and I think uh, many of my colleagues at edX and not included share, is that we will reach the unreachable. So if everyone does their part. 
um, in helping uh, the most impoverished people in the world, and they get internet access to those folks, and they get devices to those people, and the internet will change, and the devices will change, and everything else, um, then we will be able to get your university's content and everyone's content to the, to the most needy people that today we don't even have a chance of getting it there yet. So that's that's the 10-year goal um, from the edX perspective, or at least mine. Thank you very much for your very re uh, reassuring and uh, image and vision. The NPO is important, and if you are in a profit-making organization, you have to be listed in 10 years' time in the stock market. Otherwise, you might not be able to do that. And the time was limited. However, we had a very constructive discussion. Dr. Yamagi gave me instruction. The title does not sound, and so and uh, it, so. And he said, that, and why didn't you show it to me? And uh, how MOOC evolves university education. Dr. Yamagi was rather in the disagreement and, uh, with us and uh, in the use and, uh, of the evolve. Because evolve is a uh, biological term, and, uh, and Dr. Yamagi is not here. So my own personal interpretation of the word, the MOOC can, uh, can advance uh, the education, develop education. And so the, and the environment is here, living organisms are living there, and so adaptation is always proceeded with for or that and a preservation of species that result in the evolution. Maybe Dr. Yamagi's an idea of evolution is an in that context. And so a MOOC is there. So MOOC can interfere at the evolution. If so, it is not evolution. Maybe that is his, his instruction. So I would like to correct this and a title just before the concluding that. And so how does an university education to change and advance on the MOOC. And so, of course, you know, we are interested in how university education uh, uh, can change and how can MOOC can, uh, be used in that context. MOOC is here, and uh, university education uh, evolution. And so, and uh, how can the university education advance and uh, the use of a MOOC? And uh, so that will be acceptable to Dr. Yamagiwa. And, uh, and he, he might uh, actually advance uh, his uh, uh, theory of the evolution of university education or universities. I'm sorry that my talk was rather disorganized for half a day, and uh, we have uh, had uh, this uh, symposium. My special thanks address to Dr. Pugh, and the keynote address speaker, and uh, all the panel members for your contribution. Could you please uh, give them a big round of applause to express our sincerest and the deepest appreciation? Thank you.